Hey, welcome to coronavirus quarantine. The review. It sucks. Yeah. Uh, now that we're done with that review, we'll move on to... <laughs> yeah, we're... Hi, I'm Sis King. I'm Sonic Sons. Rambling reviewers. <laughs> and today we're actually reviewing the very end of Star Wars, the Clone Wars TV show, 3D animated series. Now the other Star Wars, Clone Wars TV show, 2D animated series. Way back when. Remember that one? Yeah, we actually saw the first episode together. Oh, wow. Yeah, and then Pokemon, the first movie, came out immediately afterwards. And I was confused because I was like, oh, how is this an episode? <laughs> and, and then it was like, oh, oh, it's just like a five-minute episode. I see. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's right, yeah, because originally there was like those five-minute, maybe even like three-minute things, whatever they were. They were really, really yeah. curious. Um, so, yeah, now we should say in advance that... While you have seen this Clone Wars show all the way through, uh, or closely enough, or had or, the rest of it spoiled because you've read all the <laughs> synopses and stuff, yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> I have less knowledge of it, and um, what we've just seen is the final four episodes of uh, season seven, so the, the final season, and um, it's got some interesting... Story questions to pose to us. Yeah. Writer questions. Okay, so I tried to explain this to Sonic Sons earlier because, well, there's... Uh, th these episodes are the culmination of multiple different storylines colliding with one another in the last five minutes, essentially, of the Clone Wars. First of which is that there was a plot known as the Dutch... Like, the Duchess of Mandalore, or at least the Mandalorian arc, where... Mandalore, known for being a proud warrior race in the old Legends continuity, has been disarmed and turned into a neutral pacifist state in this new continuity, which pisses off a lot of people who like the Mandalorians. Especially since the only other examples of Mandalorian warrior nature is, um, well, Death Watch, who are total pricks. To which I say, are we talking about the same Mandalorians because the old Mandalorians were assholes. Yeah. Their prime justification for going to war was, hey, those guys are within going to war distance. <laughs> right. And also, Boba Fett was just a bounty hunter. Cool and stuff, but like, a villain, obviously. Yeah, there, there aren't really that many examples of good Mandalorians in Star Wars. But there is now because of that Mandalorian show. But yeah. That's a very different time. Yeah. Um. Anyways, so long story short... There was this pacifist duchess. She had a thing with Obi Wan. They were they loved each other, but they couldn't, you know, be together because the Jedi are celibate. The Jedi are celibate, and uh, Duchess Satine had a thing. Anyways, and that's where we'll leave off for now, because it's on to the next plot, which is that Maul is alive. Darth Maul, the bad guy from Episode One, he's alive, and he's roaming around the galaxy, basically trying to form a criminal empire because he knows he can't compete with Palpatine. And so he teamed up with Death Watch and took over the planet of Mandalore. It makes sense in context. <laughs> Except Palpatine came back, beat his ass down, captured him, except Death Watch then broke him out again, and now there's a Death Watch, Death Watch civil war because Maul killed Duchess of Teen. And, um... So yeah, there's two factions of Death Watch now. One's good, one's bad, and they're fighting each other. So, yeah. And the story takes place at the very end of the Clone Wars. As in, partway through this story, Anakin and Obi-Wan have to leave the story because Coruscant is being attacked by General Grievous and Count Dooku. That's a thing. Yeah, if you remember from episode three. Attack, uh... Revenge of the Sith. Yeah, Revenge of the Sith from way back in 2005. Yeah. Yeah, simpler time. Hmm. There was no coronavirus, at least. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so what this episode... The episode starts out with Ahsoka Tano, who... In Star Wars The Clone Wars, Anakin Skywalker was assigned a Padawan, despite him being only a knight. And he was assigned a Togruta female named Ahsoka Tano. Well, shit happened over the course of the war. And Ahsoka left the Jedi Order after being framed for a bombing of the Jedi Temple. And was kicked out of the Order. But then they realized, oh wait, you weren't the ones who did it. So we're going to, I don't know, let you back in. But she said no. 
And now she's going around doing good deeds and stuff. She's an independent Jedi. She's a Ronin in a way. Yeah, kind of. Jedi aren't exactly like samurai, but whatever. Right. So she goes to Mandalore and gets Bo-Katan, she's the leader of the good faction of Mandalorians, to ask the Republic for help. Hey, can you help us? Because Darth Maul took over the planet. Again. Because <laughs> we just suck at this. Yeah. And so, you know, the Obi-Wan and Anakin go, Oh, well, we can't do that. We can't go to Mandalore. There are treaties saying we can't. I'm confused what treaties they're referring to. The old government has toppled, right? They didn't sign a treaty with the Death Watch, I'm sure. Yeah, and even if, and even if they, there were treaties earlier in the series, that was the whole point of a plot. Back in, back in like either season one or season two, the Duchess of Mandalore plot was about Duchess Satine going to Coruscant and saying, "No, we don't need Republic intervention. You don't need to bring troops here," despite everyone saying we need to send troops to Mandalore to handle the Death Watch. Which is like something they can apparently do without breaking treaties. Because no one brought it up back then. Yeah, in fact, that, that was the whole point. The bad guys wanted the Republic to invade Mandalore so the populace would, would rise up and join Death Watch in order to free their people. And now, we want you to bring the Republic in anyway while acknowledging that the people we pissed off about this due to long, well, age-old tensions between uh, Mandalorians and the rest of the Republic... But it's cool, you know, circumstances require it, I guess. Yeah, apparently. But Anakin is super excited to see Ahsoka, and he's like, oh, by the way, I got your lightsabers, and I modified them so they're blue now, because they were green before. Um, okay, cool. And it's at this point that where Anakin has to exit the story because he's needed for Revenge of the Sith. But before he does, he gives his second-in-command... Uh, Commander Rex uh, promotion so he can lead a group of the 501st to join Ahsoka in going to Mandalore to fight Maul and his people. Yes. So we're not so worried about treaties anymore. We're good. <laughs> yeah. It was like this whole thing where everyone's like, I must discuss this with the council. And the council's like, that's a bad idea. And then they do it anyway. Yeah, it wasn't made super clear. It was just like, we're in a hurry. I mean, yeah, anyways, so so we wave goodbye to Obi-Wan and Anakin, who despite being two of the main characters of the series, I guess just kind of leave. See, yeah, this is I would have made the series, I mean, it'd be hard to sell this, I know, but if you know your main characters can't be here for the end, make someone else your main character. Make make it this is like the story of Ahsoka in the Clone Wars and uh, Obi Wan and Anakin are her supporting cast, which I, I guess they kind of were in this particular instance. In the last four episodes, they certainly were. Yeah, but make the whole series based around her arc, right? Okay, you could argue that like the rest of the series has been at least partially her arc, but mm. at the same time, I get what you're going for. Why include them at this particular juncture if you know they're basically just going to show up, do a few cool tricks? snark at each other and then leave well it's not even this juncture it's like we must have invested all this time and energy in them this whole time uh which granted people do want to see more of anakin and obi-wan but they can't be here for the ending unless you just redo the ending everyone's already seen and because we've already seen it there's less mystery as to where they end up and ahsoka can be more of an audience wild card and more of a surprising as to what the heck happens with her you know yeah i guess like that's the only real thing you can do with her at this point point. and i will grant that a lot of people did wonder what exactly happened to ahsoka after she left the jedi temple now granted rebels does answer that conclusively she survived the jedi purge and went on to become a secret agent known as fulcrum but that wasn't really that satisfying for the Clone Wars fans, so I guess we did this instead. Um, okay. Yeah, I wonder if they would have, could have, should have set that up more at the end of this uh, to let us know, okay, Ahsoka is going to have a proactive role in the future. Because last we see her, she's kind of walking off into the distance, as it were. And you don't know exactly what she's going to do. She puts down one of her lightsabers. Yeah. I don't know why she puts down just one. Yeah, I mean, the, the the symbolism we're getting at, too, is that they want that final scene where Darth Vader shows up and he finds the lightsaber and he knows it was Ahsoka's and so he's 
reflecting on, you know, their history or something, right? Just silently. But, like, invent some other trinket that is specifically Anakin and Ahsoka's thing. And she puts that down. And it's not a deadly weapon she's totally going to need in the the years ahead. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's... Uh, mm. Or, I mean, it actually just goes into fan and I'd invented earlier. But I like the idea that uh, when a knight gra- or when a Padawan graduates to a knight... They uh, return the lightsaber to their master and build their own lightsaber as part of the graduation process. Yeah, that Because Luke be had nice. that kind of a thing. He lost his old lightsaber, and then he made a new one, and he's all like, see, you made a new lightsaber. Your skills are complete. So that would seem to be a graduation ceremony type of thing. And admittedly, building your own lightsaber was an important step of uh, being a Jedi. Right. The point is, if you have that more specifically in here, this could be, I'm putting down the old one because I just built a new one. So now I'm still dual wielding shit. I'm not making myself defenseless for the future. <laughs> yeah. I mean, kind of like Rey. Had, Rey built her own lightsaber in uh, Rise of Skywalker by yeah. the end with that yellow one. Yeah. I barely remember that, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, new Star Wars. Why are you so inconsistent? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, anyways, uh, stuff goes on. Um, Ahsoka leads Rex and the division of the 501st get down to Mandalore, and they start kicking Death Watch ass. And eventually they go down into the sewers, because of course they do. Because Maul is hiding there, and we know he hasn't left the city, because apparently we're really good at watching all the exits to the city. Yeah, and have x-ray vision so we know what's inside each <laughs> ship. <laughs> ah, <whatever>. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I will grant a five foot nothing, half robot, uh, Dathomirian with red and black tattoos all over your body and head spikes. It's not exactly something you can hide that well. If he's in a ship, he's hidden. Okay, fine. These are not made of glass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, granted, I do think the Mandalorians have stupid ship designs. In some cases, mm. in the case of these particular ships, mm. I love the Keldabi class battleship. It's so beautiful. But anyways. Uh, so they confront, uh, Ahsoka, like, slowly gets her numbers whittled away until finally she's alone with Maul and his Death Watch minions, and he goes, what the hell, you're not Obi-Wan or Anakin. So see, even Darth Maul <laughs> thinks that Anakin and Obi-Wan can have a bigger role in this plot. Right, <laughs> so I would have, I would have built this, again, if we were building around Ahsoka, uh, as cool as Maul is, since he is so tied in with those other people's stories... Either give him a closer tie to Ahsoka, or come up with a new villain to be Ahsoka's main yeah. person to tangle with. Yeah, some like if even if it was Ventress, that would be more because anything more connected to the character. Yeah, because they they were both they were both former apprentices to you know a force user, and they both have a dual wielding style, and they have met before. This was actually the first time Darth Maul and Ahsoka Tano meet. In fact, a big part of what Darth Maul does after meeting Ahsoka is tracking down a clone who can tell him who the hell is Ahsoka <laughs> Tano. Right, yeah, what was important about that, actually? You know, yeah. The guys were like, I told him everything because he like used the Force to extract his information. Yeah. But like, was there an important piece of information they didn't have before besides like her name? He already knew her name, though. She yeah, he, he barely knew her name. He had to, like, test it out a few times to get it right. <laughs> and, and that's just kind of sad. I mean, yeah. No, no offense. And for all the complaints we have here, everything was gorgeous. There's the, a lot of good, yeah. The music was amazing. Yeah. The animation was fluid. They upped up the animation. I don't say it's been a complaint to mine in earlier episodes. Oh, yeah. How janky it is. So I'm glad for the improvements they did. I'm glad for a lot of the set pieces... It's gotta have those when you're in Star Wars. So there's a bit where um, Ahsoka's talking to Maul across the span of this empty room with big glass windows looking at him with random explosions in the distance. I'm like, okay, this is a very Star Wars set piece. I like this. You mm-hmm. know, it's this is visually evocative. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, and then they had cool fight scenes, and they were fighting among the girders at one point. The, well, they the brought back building. Ray. They brought back Ray Park to do the mocap work for Darth Maul, and he's yeah. the original guy who yeah, was Darth Maul. After 20 years, he's still Darth Maul. And all the fight choreography is magnificent and beautiful. But the whole time, Darth Maul has been giving like this kind of commentary about everything, how everything is about to change drastically, uh, how nothing will be the same, and um, 
chaos will soon engulf the galaxy. So he orders his crime lord buddies to run for their lives. Meanwhile, he tells the Death Watch that you will die as soldiers, which I think I would start having questions the instant the plan starts with, you're going to die. Yeah, he does say if you die, but whatever. And then he sets them off to go fight the other Death Watches. Because, I don't know how that benefits Maul, honestly. Uh, it distracts them so that he could get to his ship up uh, in, above the girders. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Uh, yeah, but they eventually capture Maul, and Maul actually starts sounding f- scared and panicked. That was the best voice acting I've heard in this uh, show, is that moment when they ca- he's been captured, and he's like, Oh, you have no idea what's going to happen! Like, And that's great because, you know, it's, it's an angle on the great disaster that I've never seen expressed before. We, even though we were in the thick of it, we never had a character in episode three... Who was like, holy shit, stuff is happening, and I can feel it, and it's foreboding, and no, like a Cassandra, essentially. Um, that's a great way to play up the, the bigness of the problem, right? The scale of the problem. Bigness is such a lame word. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Ahsoka and Rex and the 501st leave Mandalore, and everything's happy and hunky-dory, and uh, Rex and Ahsoka start talking to each other, and they're like, you know, I deeply respect you. You're my good friend. You just know shit's about to happen at this stage. Yeah, well, especially because we've all seen episode three. <laughs> also, it should be noted that at certain points in the story, she Ahsoka's been talking to various canon char- well, main movie characters about this sort of thing. Uh, Obi-Wan, she talks to and she gets reports, oh, okay, uh, so Count Dooku is dead. And furthermore, the Anakin is spying on the Chancellor, where even Ahsoka has to go, dude, Anakin loves the Chancellor. He's his mentor. Well, one of his mentors. He's going to be really pissed about that. You shouldn't do that. To which Obi-Wan just goes, sorry, the Council ordered it. So, guess it's happening. (laughs) Then we walk into the middle of a conversation that actually happened in Episode 3, which was kind of cool. But at the same time, it's kind of one of those, oh, you had an opportunity to potentially change something, but we can't because that would be changing something that already happened 15 years ago. Yeah. Because Maul basically spills, Anakin's been groomed this whole time to be uh, Darth Sidious' apprentice. Which, I don't know, might have set off some red flags in the Jedi Council and maybe, I don't know, made them send anyone else to do Anakin's work. Yeah. Yeah. So she doesn't mention that though, and granted, I can see why, because she she just does disbelieve Maul. She has no much reason, not much reason to trust him. Yeah. Uh, doesn't want to cast, you know, doubt on Anakin. Uh, but also has a grudge against the Jedi Council for you know throwing her under the bus. Right. Well, I know it's not like she has a grudge to the extent of I will totally stand here while they all die. Well, no, she didn't know that was going to be the outcome. But at the well, same, well, no, time. but like if she if she honestly believed there was a traitor in their midst who was planning to kill them, and he's figuring he's going to kill at least one or two people, you know, she would be loyal yeah. enough to see like, hey, there's a traitor. Here he is. So, so she didn't say it because she didn't believe it was true. Um, but like this is like, one of her most important relationships in her life is her mentor is is Anakin right yeah and so taking that angle of of realizing that he's gone evil and realizing that she was wrong and realizing uh that she maybe could have done something in advance and maybe losing her faith in humanity a bit you know all this other stuff would have been great if she had any chance to interact with Anakin around the time of his uh, turning evil. You know, like get to talk to him or or even just find some excuse for her to know about the stuff. Like she force senses that, quote, something terrible has happened. And from the dialogue, we know it's when Anakin uh, kills Mace Windu. Uh, yeah. But she doesn't really uh, interpret it that way. Like she doesn't fully understand it or whatever. She just knows something bad happened to Anakin. Right. And then it's all this stuff with clones, which is cool and all, but... The most important thing that will ever happen between you and Anakin is happening right now, and you're not allowed to interact with that storyline. Right. It's... <laughs> it's, it's hmm. hmm. You know, I would love to see how she reacts to the knowledge that Anakin has betrayed them all, and the emotional hurdle she has to go through dealing with that. Right? Yeah. I Could mean, there have been room for that somewhere? I th- that happens in Rebels. 
I think. Okay, well, I haven't seen Rebels. Well, I haven't seen Rebels either. Okay. Well, who knows then? Uh, but anyway, so after the touching scene where Rex and Ahsoka basically do everything but do the special secret, super secret handshake to show that <laughs> they're best friends forever and that in no way in five seconds will Rex be hunting her like a dog across the ship. Yeah. Uh, Ahsoka starts getting the visions of using like the actual dialogue from episode three. He's too dangerous to be kept alive. What have I done? We need him alive. Unlimited power, which I am very thankful that they kept in. Because that is just the best scene. Of the, one of the best scenes of the prequels. Just because of how stupidly awesome it is. Yeah. Also, it's one of the first times I think Sidious has ever truly let loose on screen. Uh, yeah, it's that and the end of episode 6. Everything else is just kind of standing around and talking ominously. Yeah. Also... You know, just shouting old people while... Old people shouting while shooting lightning from their hands. It's just <laughs> always going to be a plus. I see. So... Ahsoka runs up to Rex after Rex has gotten the command. And you can see Rex is visibly fighting it. And it's here I have to backtrack a bit because it's a bit genius what just happened. Back in Season 6, a.k.a. the unreleased season, a.k.a the Disney deal Disney bought Star Wars mm. from under uh, Disney bought Star Wars and said the Cartoon Network couldn't keep running the show mm. so season 6 was ready but it was unreleased one of the storylines from there was what's known as the Order 66 arc which might actually have to have a different name now that the Order 66 actually happened Wait, why would you need to change the name if it still relates to Order 66? Because there's now two arcs that relate to Order 66. Ah, yeah, I guess, yeah. uh, essentially, a character that we followed for, like a, side, a minor side char- clone side character that we followed for a while, Tup, his, turns out that he has a biological chip in his skull that malfunctions. And it causes him to execute Order 66 and execute a Jedi general by shooting her in the fucking head. Jeez. Yeah, so long story short, another clone trooper, Fives, so named because his serial number is CT5555. It's a mystery why he's called Fives, honestly. (laughs) Right. Finds out about the chip, finds out that all of his brothers have it, and tries to tell everyone the truth about the chips. Except that this all gets swept under the rug, and ultimately the only person who knows anything is Rex, Anakin, and Obi-Wan. Anakin and Obi-Wan do nothing with this information because they figure that Fives is acting crazy. Partially because he was. As in he had them trapped inside of a ray shield trap and was screaming about how there was a secret conspiracy to murder the Jedi. Mm -hmm. And brain controlling chips. Mm -hmm. Admittedly, I would not believe him either. (laughs) But Rex figured something was up with the chip because he he took that particular clue to heart. So before he starts blasting at Ahsoka, he mentions uh, Clone Trooper Fives, and then every all hell breaks loose as they start trying to kill Ahsoka. Uh, they do not succeed, obviously, given that I've mentioned that she survives into Rebels, and Ahsoka frees Maul in order to cause chaos and destruction, just to, as a diversion. This works! It does. I don't think she meant for him to go as far as she did, though, as he did, though. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a little odd. Uh, several things are odd here. One of them is this later point in which she refuses to kill mind-controlled clones because, you know, they're good people underneath. But she is totally willing to let Darth Maul loose aboard a ship knowing full well he will probably kill people. That's his thing. Yeah. Admittedly, I mean, like, he chopped a guy's arm off and not with a lightsaber. That guy totally died. I mean, I get the ethics says that it's harder... It's easier to say, oh, okay, so none of those deaths are on my conscience because I didn't kill them. Yeah, but I, w- I would like her to feel a little guilty about all this, you know? And she could say during that later scene, like, I've probably let, you know, led too many of them to their deaths already. I won't do any more, right? Yeah, that's fair. Like, you know, just, just give me a line. Okay. Anyways, she reads the mission reports from those epi- the Order 66 arc where Rex confirms that there is a chip and I don't know what it's doing except that it kind of freaks me out and I don't know what it does. Mm. So she, she, with the help of some comic relief astromech droids, drags them to the, drags them to the medical bay, removes the chip in a 
Brain surgery that takes like five minutes. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. That's an exaggeration. Yeah, yeah one minute. <laughs> yeah. I mean, admittedly, they proved they can do that back in the Order 66 arc. Fives had his removed in, again, an outpatient basis. All right. They have really good surgery in the future. Yeah. In but the he's... past. I'd like there to be a little more um, distance between uh, we were just poking in your brain and here's a deadly weapon. Because yeah. that is a thing you shouldn't do. You know, I've suddenly realized since that when they bust out of there, they stun everybody, right? Mm-hmm. Grab one of those guys, put him in that pod. Now there are two clones on your side. Grab another guy, put him mm. in the pod. Now there are three clones. I, I was actually wondering that, but uh, <laughs> it might have been difficult to do that while like legions of clone troopers are converging on yeah, your position yeah, all it's shooting. It's a little unclear how many clones are around and whatever the red level of danger is. Yeah, plus, you know, you don't I don't know how long stun blasts last, so just hit keep hitting them. It's not like you only have two blasts or something. I always assume those things keep going forever. Hmm, fair enough. Um so they escape to the hangar cuz all the escape pods have been destroyed. Meanwhile, Darth Maul has been slaughtering everyone. <laughs> Because that's kind of his thing. Mm. And decides that the best thing to do in this situation is to go down to the hyperdrive and start ripping them apart with the Force. While they're in hyperspace. <laughs> Which apparently you can do without blowing up the ship. Yeah, it's weird. Star Wars ships are generally known for as soon as you get inside them and start shooting anything, it starts to explode. Uh, there's a fair bit of explosion there, yeah. Yeah, but... Uh... Anyway, so the ship starts crashing onto an unknown, what looks like, desert planet. Which, by the way, is incredibly good timing for Darth Maul. Yeah. Like, there has to be way less than 1% of their time spent in hyperspace is within reasonable range of a planet. Yeah. <laughs> That's... Hmm. <laughs> it's just... I use the Force to navigate or something. I don't know. Yeah, the Force tends to act in mysterious ways, and, and unfortunately, I'm not kidding about that. It's... Tends to work out favorably for Force Sensitives, and fuck anyone else, am I right? Anyways, um... So they're in orbit, or not really, they're in crashing around this, this big old planet. Uh, finally, it answers a little question about, that a lot of us have wondered, why was Anna, why was Ahsoka targeted in Order 66? Because we know she engaged people in Order 66, we, didn't, we know that now. Did we know that previously? Uh, we did. She, she mentioned it, like, once or twice, I think. How did she mention it before it happened? Are you talking about Rebels again? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I haven't seen Rebels. So. Again, I haven't seen Rebels either. Oh. Just, you know, <laughs> look, I, I watch a lot of things about Rebels just so I know what the ships and tactics are and how Grand Admiral Thrawn was apparently killed by space whales and a time-traveling wolf and... That's legends, ain't it? No. <laughs> no, I am not. They brought back the space whales... From Legends into... Th oh, for heaven's sake. And they kill Thrawn. Well, what the heck are these books we have on the table here? The I Thrawn books. I don't fucking know! <laughs> Maybe he's not dead. He's just mostly dead. Oh, jeez. I don't even... <laughs> Anyways. So, it turns out that Sidious ordered... Okay, Order 66, which is to kill all the Jedi, but also kill Ahsoka Tano... Normally, you, you gotta get, give props to Pal Palpy McScrotum face there because, you know, slipping your name specifically into a galaxy-wide genocide order, that's kind of a dedication. Also, it actually wasn't in there in specifically. This was, this was an odd uh, uh, plot hole. What happens is we see the guy say, execute order 66, and he says, it will be done. And then he resists and the shooting and all that stuff happens. Then, a moment later, he tells all the clones, as if they don't already know, we've just received Order 66, which says that we must execute all Jedi leadership as traitors to the Republic. Leadership, he says specifically, and not Jedi in general. And then later, when he's facing down that other clone, that clone's like, Sir, you told us specifically that we were killed to, in order to kill Ahsoka Tano. No, he didn't tell you that. He said, kill all Jedi leadership. Uh, and she's not a Jedi. So he, no, he didn't say that at all. He might have done it off screen. He might have done it off screen. I yeah. mean, like, okay, Sidious could have gone, okay, so uh, I'm doing Order 66 right now, then I can go and fine-tune the orders later. Yeah. You know, say, yeah, okay, this is Darth, 
By the way, Rex, this is Darth Sidious. Tell your men to kill Ahsoka Tano specifically, since she's Anakin's Padawan, and it would be really, really tragic for him to lose his Padawan. He's going to lose her when she's dead. What do you mean? It would be tra- yes. It would- oh, he wants tragedy on purpose? Is that the angle you're going Yeah, at? you know, because oh, suffering oh. leads to the dark side. Oh, okay, stuff. okay. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those weird contradictions how, you know, dark side of the Force users tend to ally with each other once they torture each other enough. It's stupid. Mm, yeah. Yeah. It's the inverse of the of the Dark Helmet uh, rule. Now you see that good will always triumph because evil is dumb. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Spaceballs. Mm. Is it sad that I think Dark Helmet was a better villain than Kylo Ren? <laughs> yeah, he was definitely more entertaining. I also thought he looked better. Mm. Look, I'm so, I'm sorry, people. I know Adam Driver is a talented actor. I don't think he looks good. He looks pouty and whiny all the time. I'm sorry. Nah. But, yeah, so Maul steals the only shuttle and flies away. Actually, the only shuttle on this level, it turns out. Level two, as there were other ones, because they eventually yeah. get away on that. So, the clones are all trying to kill Rex and Ahsoka, having since killed off all the comic relief astromech droids, which... You know, oh, that's dick move. They're yeah. just Astromex. Mm. They're like little R2s, except not R2, because they suck in comparison to R2. <laughs> right, right, right. Anyways, they managed to get... Ahsoka and Rex managed to get into a Y-Wing bomber and escape the ship before it slams into the planet. Right. There's a moment before that I want to discuss, though, and that's when they're up in the hangar control room, uh, Ahsoka and Rex, and... All the clones, you know, 100, 200 clones or something are arrayed out before them. Uh, and it's like, all right, if we walk down there at all, they're going to shoot us all instantly. And this is the bit I was mentioning before. She's like, you know, he says, oh, do you think we can just fight through them? And she says, no, I don't want to kill my fellow clones. Yeah, not fellow I want to kill the clones that used to be my buddies like five minutes ago. Um, and I really thought they were going to do an interesting dramatic moment there. In which, because because by the way, they've also opened up the um, the the main hangar door so you can see the planet, and of course there must be a force field or something keeping them in and a gravity thing keeping them in. But she says, "I don't want to kill them," and I really wanted Rex to say, "Then I'll do it," and he hits the buttons to turn off the atmosphere to vent the clones into space because, like, as the commander of the clones. It's like he has to take responsibility for this action, you know? Like, this is the only way type of a thing. It'd be really sad. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, like, so appropriate to this otherwise sad moment to the whole galaxy, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And then they go from... Although a better option would have been, like, this is Commander Rex. I meant Ahsoka Tano took me prisoner for a little while, but I managed to escape. But before she could, she unleashed a Jedi toxin. Come to the medical bay so that you can... (laughs) Get, like, this immunization to the Jedi toxin. Come to think of it, yeah. At that point, they don't know Rex is working with... A, I mean, they might know. They run it, they did some running gun with other clones. Mm-hmm. But he might have just walked out alone, because they did this whole fake prisoner thing. And then they do an arguing about the details of whether or not you're supposed to kill Ahsoka. She's not actually a Jedi, um, technically. But he might have walked out alone and said, Men, I order you to go anywhere else. You know, Ahsoka's on the other end of the ship. And then, yeah, maybe even your thing. And then get the chips out of your head. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just have, like, Ahsoka hide in a closet or something and say, No, no, I checked this section of the ship. You should just go get checked over. I yeah, mean, that steals the, bra- the drama right out of this. They have another can, option. If you can do brain surgery on an outpatient basis... I think that maybe, you know, this is a little less dramatic than you intended. Yeah, and and that's just sad, because there's so much potential for drama here. And then, you know, there was definitely cool moments. And when they're, you know, landing the Y-Wing, there's a lot of, like, Ahsoka is free falling and jumping on stuff and trying to get to there's a lot of action y cool stuff. Which I thought would have been a lot more dramatic if we hadn't seen Ahsoka willingly jump out of a spaceship at the beginning of the arc and then parkour her way across multiple starships, showing that she's perfectly capable of doing this while landing perfectly fine. Yeah. So some sense of risk would be nice. 
Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. It was a very dramatic and well-executed end to it. It could have just been a lot better. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, they cra- the whole ship crashes. Everybody dies except Ahsoka and Rex and Maul got away earlier. Yeah. Uh, then they bury, like, what looks like 50 of them. I guess it was the, those are the bodies they could find. Yeah, I mean, granted, the usual complement of a Star Destroyer has got to be like a couple thousand so they'd be there for a while. Yeah, I understand. Um, so then they're bidding farewell to these people who were their friends until the last moments. That ah oh man, I feel like they, they could have done a lot more with this though. Yeah, but they didn't say anything. They just kind of. They did. I mean, not, not even necessarily like that. That moment, what more they could have done? You could have built up previously more. Um, like. For one thing, when a, when Rex turns evil briefly and tries to kill Ahsoka, uh, A, he struggles with the pistols for a few seconds, but then is, like, completely on board until the brain surgery. And how about he keeps struggling the whole time? Give me the drama in that, right? And or, uh, make the clones clearly have lost their personalities, and they, they talk, you know, more monotone and stuff, and... This is what happens when you get brand controlled, right? Yeah, I mean, they're not going like... Because then you could fight back between, like, the monotone voice and the, oh, no, wait, no, I just realized what I'm doing voice, right? And then you could, mm-hmm. then you could feel for them more, and it's more like, oh, it's plot points are walking around trying to shoot us, like usual. Um, and, and B, have Ahsoka really shaken by the fact that her, one of her best friends has suddenly turned on her. You know, she, she takes this, like, really well in stride. Okay, well, I'm going to go look um, at the logs. Let me do this. Let me do that. That actually checks out for me. Um, after the second battle of Geonosis, there was an episode called Brain Invaders where Geonosian brain worms infected the crew of a ship that Ahsoka was on and tried to kill her. Mm-hmm. So at this point, it's like, oh, this shit again? Someone mind-controlled the clones? Yeah, but good luck getting drama out of that. Like... Play it for something. Play it for, if it's going to be, this has happened several times, play it for, oh no, not again. Right? If, if you're going to do a, a story whose overall arc, like the seven season arc, it, it eventually comes down to betrayal, give me somebody who, you know, is has struggles with being betrayed or has struggled in the past, but now, like, has the grit she didn't have in previous seasons to deal with that shit, you know? Give me someone who is tempted to lash out in anger, perhaps, of like, God damn it, this again, stop it, stop it, you know, give me, get, get depressed because, no, it's happening, fear, give me something other than I am a Jedi and I'm entirely 100% on top of this at all times. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you remember when Luke was in the, uh, the second Death Star and the emotional hurdles he had to go through with all this anger versus mercy versus the, 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 the fear and he's freaking out when he's being zapped by Palpatine. A range! A range of feelings. And granted, it's not like there was no feelings. There was the grief at the end there, and the funeral scene thing, and stuff. But you could have played it more, writers! Yes. This could have been so many things. <sighs> uh, I would love to see the clones, too, take a more active role in in fighting and, and, and perhaps dying as heroes, right? You could do a thing of... Uh, to go back to my earlier idea, a clone realizing that he's about to shoot somebody, do something evil, so he deliberately, like, hits a button to vent himself out an airlock. Or, right? or just pulls the gun on himself. Pulls the gun on himself, you know. You know, like, like in Star Trek Wrath of Khan, when that one guy was told, now execute Kirk. Yeah. Now execute Captain James T. Kirk. And he's like, I don't want to, master. And, and then he just vaporizes himself after some better lines than just i yeah, don't yeah, want yeah, to yeah. master um you know oh oh you know what if you could have rules lawyered this um if somehow or other they could if you have to establish this earlier some sort of concept of like honorary jedi or whatever right and then you could just like get her blessing or something or like do it yourself somehow with a ceremony <laughs> as be an honorary Jedi and then they all get to shoot each other yeah. hopefully not as it wouldn't be comedic the point is like it, it, it trying to hack your way around the brain hacking right yeah 
I mean, the easiest way to do that would be to, like, you know, find the file where he says execute order 66 and, cha and change the voice a bit so it's like execute order 65. <laughs> just some because, other order. No, no. Execute order 65 is a great order because the reason why it's 66 isn't just because it's one off from 666. Mm. Although that's possibly a reason I don't really know. I mean, know. symbolically, I'm sure it's a reason, but... Yeah, it's because it's part of 150 contingency orders that were installed into the clones as part of the Grand Army of the Republic. Mm -hmm. uh, just, uh, just as, uh, you know, what to do in case of these particular situations. Mm -hmm. Order 65 is the, g <laughs> the Supreme Chancellor is compromised. <laughs> Remove him from power immediately. <laughs> Which would have really changed a lot of the things in Star Wars. <laughs> Yeah. And I did read a story someone wrote where where Palpatine screwed up. He like was still a little frazzled from getting force lightning to his skull. So it was like, which order was it? Oh, execute order sixty five. Are you sure, my lord? <laughs> <laughs> and so it cuts to the next day where there's a news anchor saying, "Well, all the clones converged on you know Palpatine's office and arrested him for being a Sith lord. Anakin Skywalker is in therapy right now." <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Oh, God. But yeah, the ending kind of fell flat for me. It had great moments, but... Yeah. Okay, they buried the clones. They don't say anything. They don't mention, here's what I'm going to do in the future. Um, like, if Rex yeah, had you said... you made a little speech, like, in honor of these slain brothers, we will fight on to the end, type of thing, you know? Yeah, maybe not necessarily that dramatic, but yeah, something in that vein. Like, something that would hint at what they're going to do. Like uh, Ahsoka mentioning that they'll need a voice to help. Co There's going to be people who fight this. They'll need a voice. And, you know, that would sh foreshadow her role as Fulcrum in the Rebels show. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Rex might go, oh, I know some clones. They're good people. Uh, they might want to help us fight once they get the chips out. Which foreshadows that he eventually shows up in Rebels as well, living with, uh, living with Gregor and Commander Wolf. Mm-hmm. Uh, in an old ATTE, and they all have scars right over where they got the chips removed. Okay. Yeah. But... You can even just do a straight-up emotional appeal to the guys who are trying to shoot... Especially if it's, it's her own unit, right? The ones mm -hmm. who have the, the, the masks, whatever, their helmets painted with their colors. Yeah. Like, you just do, like, hey, it's me, and you you are more than... Because they had a conversation about us clones are soldiers. We were bred for to being soldiers to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. That could easily lead into a theme of a speech of, like, you are more than just soldiers. You don't have to just follow orders. And you can see them struggling with the chips in their brains... And maybe it's the whole shoot yourself thing, or maybe it's outright override the chip permanently. You know, we, with another, it's kind of like the anti Cyberman thing you do sometimes, yeah. right? Um, and like, yeah, you know, we are whatever the name of their unit is or brigade. The, the five hundred. We are the five hundred and first. Right, but then rename them at the point they become permanently good guys. You know what I mean? Like because five hundred first is associated with Darth Vader. So if there's some other, like, we are the Ahsoka Brigade or whatever the hell, you know what I'm saying? Uh, okay, I'm get, we're, we're going to workshop that right, one. Right, <laughs> obviously that's a dumb name. But the point is, I, I, it's specific to this story, specific to, you know, who, who we've been, who we've become over the last seven seasons. Yeah, and that's also kind of the problem with Anakin's appearance at the very end of the series. Or rather, I should say Darth Vader. Now, while it is awesome to see Darth Vader in the Clone Wars, what he does is he walks forward, notes the Star Destroyer, Looks down, picks up Ahsoka's lightsaber, and takes it. Yeah. That's... He doesn't say anything. He doesn't, like... He doesn't, like, press the lightsaber to his forehead as if, you know, pained by the memory. Which, admittedly, it would give him pain knowing that his Padawan is dead. Yeah, the fact is we don't know what he's feeling at that moment. He might just be all, like, from what you can see, just robotic. Like, oh yeah, this thing. Well... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Anakin Anakin was a major player in the Clone Wars. It doesn't feel right that this is his send-off. You know what they should do is just move up the timeline for a while. How about at the beginning of Season 7, Order 66 goes down, right? Or at the end of Season 6, let's say. Cliffhanger, right? Then, Season 7... It's Ahsoka with a group of clones who have successfully defied the Order, whether through surgery or just the power of love, you know, whatever. And they're on the run 
right? Just, <laughs> oh, God, I'm sorry. What? I'm sorry. It's the stupidest thing. What? <laughs> they defined it with the power of love. With the power... By the power of Camino, I am Sailor Trooper! Oh, no. Sailor Camino! Beautiful soldier, Sailor Camino! <laughs> Just imagine it in that gravelly voice. Yeah. <laughs> it looks just like a normal sailor's sailor uniform, but but it says he's got the helmet on. Gotta uh, make some fan art now. <laughs> John's. Jones, is there something you'd like to tell us? <laughs> Shut up, I'm magical! <laughs> oh, poor Jones. Yes. Anyway, though, okay. they're on the run. They're doing guerrilla tactics. Like, everything is, is changed, right? It's it's very strange and new and different. Running around and trying to survive in the midst of the ongoing purge. Because it's like, you know, two-thirds of the Jedi died on the first day, and the other third are kind of running around getting killed off bit by bit, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and she's on the quest to find Anakin. She she wants to know if her master is okay. He probably is a, he's a survivor, right? He's okay mm-hmm. somewhere. And we all know, but she doesn't know. And eventually she finds Darth Vader with the full suit and everything because it's been a couple months or whatever it's been, right? Mm-hmm. And and she has to face that betrayal and has to square off with him directly. See? Then, like obviously she can't kill him or whatever, but there could be a final confrontation, the emotional exchange. You know, the two of them end up, you know, whatever. Barship gets smashed in two and they end up going in separate directions or something uh and she has to deal with that betrayal and then rex could like put a hand on her shoulder and be like well at least we're with you to the end right so like there's been betrayal but not everyone betrays right there's still hope mm-hmm. and there's still, and we're gonna keep fighting and that's her transition to rebels boom <laughs> do that that's disney <laughs> okay here's an alternate thing yeah push the movie for back <laughs> have the season ends just before the third, before Revenge of the Sith is. Okay. Have this arc, That's and then really instead good. of doing it with Order sixty six, have it le- have the series end with Anakin and Obi Wan racing off to go rescue the Chancellor. Okay. Uh, then have this arc, and ultimately show that Ahsoka is open to the idea of working again, but show that she definitely has friction with the Jedi now. Mm. That she's grown disillusioned. She's grown up. Mm. Uh, and then mention that she's going off to continue fighting the good fight against any tyranny. You know, because she's seen a lot of uh, tyranny that isn't necessarily the separatists or the droids. Mm. Like, she's fought against Zygerian slavers. Mm. She she was captured by Trandoshans and hunted as the most dangerous game. That happened. Okay. She was saved by Chewbacca. It was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it was a bit. It was a little bit on the. Okay, that's a bit convenient. But on the, I point, I pause it on the other one hand that they showed the combined strength of the Jedi mind trick and the Wookiee mind trick. <laughs> they wave their hand in front of a trend ocean. You will tell us what we want to know. Never. <laughs> Chewbacca punches the Trandoshan in the head. <laughs> and then they repeat it. And then the Trandoshan <laughs> tells them what they want to know. Yeah. All the important events of the Star Wars galaxy happen to the same 12 people. <laughs> but anyway, yes, that's uh, cool. That's, that's kind of the for- how the Force works I in guess, general. But, yeah, <laughs> but, uh, yeah it, it doesn't feel satisfying for... The ending doesn't feel really emotionally satisfying from a character perspective. I mean, don't get me wrong. In terms of story composition, it's great. And in and of itself, the story... It, what I see this is, is an interesting first draft, sort of. Uh, and I want I honestly... The, the whole show, I've been seeing, oh, interest, there are things there, there are concepts. Obi-Wan uh, had a, a love interest in this Duchess, like you mentioned. And... Like, they bring it up, and they're like, oh, that's interesting, but you could have played with that a lot more. Instead of this one scene where he's like, okay, fine, yes, I would have left the Jedi Order for you. But anyway, the plot is happening. <laughs> you know, um, and, and, and if you're also going to be in the teeth of uh, Anakin's betrayal, you know, and this is something they didn't do so well in Episode 3 either, I would love to see the growing darkness in him happening more slowly. And, like, Ahsoka, let's say, being more and more worried about it, but, like, trying to help him, you know, type of thing. Like, not thinking he's going to betray her, but, like, thinking, like, oh, you're you're really kind of getting, you know, 
stressed, for lack of a better term, from all this war stuff, and I kind of worry about you, you know? There were elements of the show where they did show that Anakin was slipping closer and closer to the dark side, like okay. the time he outright tortured Poggle the Lesser in order to get information about the brain worms. Okay. Or the time when he... Uh, but, but, okay, so, so they did that. I'll, take, I'll grant you they, they've done things I haven't seen, but then in what we just saw, what do we see? Anakin shows up at that one bridge, has casual banter with Obi-Wan, casually walks up onto the bridge and does this fake surrender thing, and does not seem to be a troubled soul. He seems like he's doing kind of okay. Confident in battle. I want him to be a troubled soul, like, full time. <laughs> right? This is yeah. the eve of his turning evil. Let's show him that he's he's messed up inside. <laughs> yeah, bare minimum, have him look tired. Yeah. Because, you know, he's supposedly... He's been having horrible visions of his wife dying in childbirth. In fact, the novelization uh, of Revenge of the Sith even said that part of the reason why he fell so easily... He was so traumatized by these visions of his wife dying... He wasn't... He didn't sleep in between the Battle of uh, Coruscant... And when he turned into Darth Vader. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. So, no wonder his judgment was impaired. I guarantee you, Revenge of the Sith would have gone very differently if one of the Jedi healers had just seen him and gone, (laughs) and just shot like a dart into his neck (laughs) and and forced him to take a nap for like five hours. You know what I'd also like to see is a possible dramatic element. Anakin napping. That too, no. (laughs) Um, This whole time... Uh, if Ahsoka's been his apprentice, she's been looking up to him, right? Um, imagine flipping that towards the end. He's getting more and more tired and distressed, and she is giving more advice to him and trying to help him, right? Mm-hmm. And and you can see that she's grown and mature, that she's able to do that and able to call him out when he gets too violent and things like that, and, and but is still caring for him. Uh, and then at the end, if we were going with my idea where in which... Um, she gets to see him in the Darth Vader mode and realizes that it's Anakin. What her final words to him could be something like, I've failed you. Like, she feels as, even though she was the apprentice, at this point she's matured enough that she wishes she could have somehow dissuaded him from the path of darkness before it happened. And she feels bad at her failure. You know? And and then has to, like, just move on with life and do the other things with the clones and go to the Rebels show and all that. Yeah, that could have also worked out in my idea where ultimately it ends on bad terms. Things end on bad That's terms right. with yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, Anakin yeah. and Ahsoka. Yeah. In which case, it would mean that Anakin would genuinely not have anyone he could have talked to. Yeah. I mean, in a galaxy where you can talk to someone on the opposite side of the universe, galaxy, whatever, whatever uh, the fact that he's like looking for advice and trying to figure out a way to save his wife, and then he doesn't like go, "Oh wait, I can talk to my Padawan, who I can ask to please keep a secret." After all, she's not part of the Jedi Order yet; she has Force powers. Therefore, um, she doesn't have to report to the Jedi that I'm married. Yeah. But like, it would have bur- it would burn the bridge with. Between the two of them. It'd be like a very reluctant bridge burning. Because he hasn't turned evil at this point. But it'd be like, look, I just, I can't, we can't be together anymore. But it's like getting a, getting a really bad grade on a test right before you crash your car. Each of those things are bad, but ultimately they add up together to an ultimate mental breakdown. Which you could argue falling to the dark side of the force kind of is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Assuming that you're not already a sociopath. Yeah, details on that yeah uh that that could have been interesting the whole yeah find ways for them to to be broken apart to see both of them upset about the the friend breakup you know Mm -hmm. um they play with that for just a tiny moment in a way that made no sense in these ending in which it was, oh, uh, we're needed back on Coruscant. She's all like, so that's it? You're going to abandon the people of Mandalore? And you're like, the people on Coruscant are people too. Ahsoka, uh, like, this is seven, not a good argument. Seven, okay, uh, yeah, Ahsoka uh, is asking, oh, we need your help to free the people of Mandalore from Darth Maul, from Maul's rule. Uh, and they're going, yeah, that's great and all, but a separatist fleet is attacking Coruscant. We're needed there. And she goes, Oh, I should have known it. You're playing politics. 
What politics? This is basic mathematics. <laughs> Even at its best, Mandalore does not have the population of Coruscant. Yeah. Also, Coruscant, Mandalore is not part of the Republic at this point. It's neutral in the conflict. And in fact, if you bring your guys here, you'll be starting another war, which they specifically mention. Even though, as we said earlier, that makes no goddamn sense. Yeah. You know, so, it, let's see. Planet that, if we go there, could start another war. Our own people and our base of operations and trillions of life forms will be killed if we don't do this thing. Hmm. Which will I choose? Right, and granted, they do end up splitting their forces to handle both conflicts, but she, the way she phrases it, she's like, you know, as if it was an either-or thing and you would have to choose Mandalore. Uh, yeah, why, why would you choose Mandalore? Why does she it's, care about Mandalore so much again? <laughs> Forget. It's probably in the episodes we skipped over. Uh, okay. You think this would be like, this is my planet and my people, and that's why I have a special invest, uh, in the invested feeling. Right, maybe. It. Although she might be it just projecting her anger at the Jedi Council, who did throw her under the bus for political reasons. So she sees this as like another political thing. I don't know. Do you wonder you, if you could tie her disillusionment with Anakin to that? Yeah. Like he uh, he failed to stand up for her when he had the chance, kind mm -hmm. of a thing. Because I maybe Obi Wan told him to keep his mouth shut, and he was like, "Okay, fine." And now she's all pissed off about it. Yeah, something like that. I could also see something along the lines of um, she insists that they do this Mandalore thing, and Anakin says no. Maybe he's like really you know uh, short with her because he's just pissed off in general these days and she ends up like faking some orders from him to go grab a detachment of clones and take them to mandalore uh and that could be something of a bridge burning moment i'm sure there's better ways to do that but just came to mind mm. yeah guys build up your themes better Mm. You need to write more professional stuff. That's what we need you to. <laughs> yeah, see, it's it's not that we're. Mm. I like Clone Wars. I liked the Clone Wars. I just keep finding all the ways to improve it. So I'm, you know. Yeah, which, I, by I, the way, after this, we're watching the um. Have you seen the Umbara arc? No. Oh my god! What is Umbara? It's the best arc of Clone Wars. Oh, okay. Ever. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So. Um. Yeah, I think that's all our thoughts on this. All right. That's about it. Oh, by the way, I should mention that uh, Ahsoka outlived Darth Vader. No, seriously, the finale of Rebels happens after the Battle of Endor. Ahsoka's still alive then. Wow, she's been fighting in the background this whole time? Apparently. Never joined up with the proper Rebel fleet or anything? I guess not. Okay, good for uh, you. There was a thing, I don't I don't really get it. The, look, time travel was involved and it was stupid. Oh, really? Apparently it <laughs> That's was new for Star Wars. very stupid. Uh, anyway, but... We, it's pretty guaranteed that she died before episode nine happened because you can hear her voice as one of the voices of the Jedi talking to Rey. Oh, okay. Anyway, yeah. So I guess that's everything about the final four episodes. All right. May the force be with you. But, oh. You say I'm Sith King. I'm Sith King. <laughs> and I'm Sonic Sons. May the force be with you. May the force be with you. Oh.